Hello, today is September 25th, 2010. We're meeting today with Mr. Keith Holcomb at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Keith, and thanks for sitting down to tell your story today. Let's start out, if we could. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. I, I am Keith Holcomb. I uh, born October 27, 1920, in Carrington, North Dakota. Um, I uh, graduated from high school in Grinnell, Iowa, and uh, um, from that point on, I uh, worked, helped my dad on a farm there, and then. I so you, how long did you live in North Dakota before you guys moved down to Iowa? Oh, just about eight years. So okay, so basically you grew at up the in the beginning of the Great Depression. So. Well, that's one question I, uh, I always like to ask for your generation prior to we get into your military experience. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the Great Depression and how it affected you and your family? And Yeah, uh, because um, my grandfather was born in Ontario <clears throat> and he two brothers and friends came down to, to uh, North Dakota and, and got, started homesteading there in 1881. And, uh, and, and uh, he uh, established, they established their homestead east of what is now Carrington, about four miles. And he had, they broke the prairie and built their soddies and and had a, he had a wonderful farm there, good raised wheat, livestock, and so on. And that went well until about 1928, uh, seven, and uh, he had apparently, uh, times, <clears throat> the bankers then wanted him nursed. He bought, he borrowed more, too much money, and uh, as it ended up, he lost the farm, a good farm, and a lot of that happened to a lot of people. Sure, yeah. And uh, my dad was farming it at the time, and he was very, very unhappy about that, so he didn't, he left there, and in, um, in, in 19, I remember 1928, it seems it was that 28 or 29 the big crash came and people lost their money and folks my mother and dad lost a lot of theirs but they had enough they moved on down <clears throat> to Iowa and that's where Iowa came in so I was there and Iowa is where I enlisted in the Army Air Corps in 19, 19, January 9th 1940 now, uh, of all the, the various services, how did you come to choose the Air Corps? Well, I was like a lot of kids. I just had to fly. And <laughs> so uh, that was looked like an avenue. Well, uh, because of visual problems and other, I couldn't do that. But uh, I was in the Army Air Corps then. The fact is, when I enlisted, I enlisted at Fort Des Moines, Iowa, <clears throat> which later became a WAC yeah, right. base. Okay. Uh -huh. um, I was given a choice when I enlisted. I could go to the to the field or to the Coast Artillery in Panama, or the Army Air Corps in Hawaii. So, at the time, the choice was very fairly easy. <laughs> now, prior to this, had you ever even been up in an airplane before? Yes, I had. Uh, I, oh, back in the uh, uh, mid-30s, uh, a couple of fellows came along. They were taking people for rides. <clears throat> the, the plane, the main one that they took pay, people for rides in was an old Ford trimotor. It really it was a good-looking old plane. So my Brother, older brother loaned me 50 cents to, to, to get, take the ride, and that was great. They had a little biplane they would take people up in, too, but 
anyway. Uh, is that, that what they called the, the barnstormers? The, well, I guess you'd call them. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, and uh, so that was my first experience with it. Wow. So, wow. So, uh, so you've enlisted your uh, at Fort uh, Des Moines, and you you choose the option of going to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, now, did you take your, your basic there in Iowa, or did you do that in, in uh, where'd you take your basic? In Hickam Field in Hawaii. Okay. Yeah. So, what was that like? Here's uh, like many people in your generation, you know, growing up, you really didn't travel too far away from home or the farm, and now you're. You're going to this exotic Hawaii. What was uh, that experience like? Well, they first from Des Moines, they put, they sent us to uh, Fort McDowell in San Francisco Bay, Angel Island. Okay. Uh -huh. Which had been a base for years for, and uh, so on. I know we were there for several weeks, and then they put us on an old World War One troop ship to go to Hawaii. Now how was that? Here's once again an Iowa farm boy going to sea. Did you get your sea legs or how was that trip? That was not good. Um, the fact is they said that was among the roughest trips that old ship had had because when we got outside of San Francisco, the Golden Gate, it hit the rough water. Right, yeah. Notorious rough waters. Everybody was sick. Oh. <laughs> and you're supposed to stay down in the hold. but with everybody being sick and yourself being sick and this odor and so on, it was just more than I could stand. Oh. I, uh, I would sneak out and get on the after well deck and uh, try to start, I'd sleep on the bench out there and, and you could see the ship going, you could see the water up above us and then we were above the water. Oh boy. Oh, it was terrible. Uh. But we, we withstood that for about five days and four to three days, I, four days, and uh, then the water was beautiful. So, and uh, but we did lose a little weight. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you enlisted, did you enlist by yourself or did you go off with buddies or I, by myself? By yourself. How how was that transition? Did you was there any sort of homesickness at all with? Uh... Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah. We were at, uh, they sent us, as I mentioned, to Fort McDowell, and then, of course, somebody came down with the measles, so we were quarantined for how many days, and uh, uh, so we were in those barracks, and, uh, and I wrote a letter to my mother to please, if she could send me a radio, so she, she did, sent a little, a little radio, which was a godsend, we, so, and, uh, so that was there. They would take us out and march us around the island once in a while. And, but we were there and until into March, early March. And then, then we went to Hawaii. And, and uh, we took our basic there, primarily marching us around close order out on the landing or the mat. And because uh, uh, Hickam Field was at that time a a new base. They were. They had about. I think they had four hangars built, and they were building more mm. and more barracks and what have you. We lived, of course, lived in tents, and which was no hardship either. But it, it that was pretty not bad. Yeah. How, how was the the transition for you going from civilian life into military life? Was that much of a transition for you? Well, of course it was. It was. It was quite a change. And as you say, we got a little, quite a little homesick. And why did I do this? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but they were enlisted for, I was enlisted for three years. And uh, uh, then uh, with, there was an option you could take a short discharge at that time in two years. But Pearl Harbor came along and put a, put a, ended that option. Right. So, yeah. Now, once you finished your, your basic, uh, were you given the option of what specialty or what training you were going to do? And where did you go from, what did you do from after basic? Well, after basic, I uh, uh, still thought I wanted to fly. <clears throat> so <clears throat> that I would have to get past the exa exams and I really wasn't qualified to do so. So. Uh, 
another fellow and I, <clears throat> uh, we took night school for a, a, a civilian man and his wife who came in on the base, and we, we went, they taught us uh, to fill in where we needed to be. So, uh, uh, so far as options of what I could do, you didn't have much choice. You had their 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 work crews for a while, and and I got so I applied to I had transferred to um, well what became uh, it it became the headquarters of the Hawaiian Air Force, oh. which uh, I was in when it was formed, and uh, uh, so then I uh, still thought I wanted to fly, so I was boning up on what I need to know. And uh, um, But at this point, they still had, the eyesight hadn't played into it? Uh, the, not the night, yet. Okay. Not yet. Okay. Um, oh, I know how I happened to get into the transportation business because I thought, now, if I'm going to study, I'll have some time to take my books along and and uh, sit and study and, right. and okay. so on, which I did. And uh, so that's what I was doing when uh, oh, I, I drove, uh, usually an Army sta staff car for the uh, headquarters because we had brass all over the place. and. Uh, we even had General Tinker, who went down on the before on the way to Midway when the Japanese were after Midway, and we had General Martin, who was had made led his crew around the world in the old planes where they flew so many so far and they had to stop. And they had their own mechanic. Each one had his own mechanic, and they had a new engine there, and he'd have to put the new engine in, and they'd go another step. Wow. Uh, so, and uh, so he was a big man and a, 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 a nice, nice man. And anyway, we had a lot of those people and got to haul them around. And, yeah. So, Did you have plenty of uh, liberty to go off and explore Hawaii at all? Did you? Did oh, you... I had plenty there before, yeah. 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 Fact is, <clears throat> our CO. Uh, who was uh, Major, or at that time Captain Ralph Rudy, was, he would let us get a, a vehicle on a weekend and the mess sergeant would put up a, a bunch of food and we'd take off for a beach, spend the day in the beach. Oh, wow. Which, <laughs> that must have been exciting for an Iowa or, farm boy. Yeah, yeah, it was. Or we'd travel around and uh, different I'd been around the island many times, and so so that was fun. We 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 did a lot of that. So well, let's start let's start working up towards that that fateful day on December seventh. Prior to Pearl Harbor, what was the general feeling uh, in the air? Was, was there a feeling we were going to go to war, or what was the the thought? You know, just the general feeling in the air during prior to. There were a lot of, of course, rumors, rumors, and rumors of war, and uh, um, but nothing solid. We uh, would be rumors that, that something had been sighted, and of course they send a, had the old B-18 bombers, and they'd go out and, and uh, patrol with those, and uh, but uh, that was when. The, now I can't remember the Japanese. Diplomats went they went to Washington and said everything is just hunky dory. Yeah, yeah. So that's when they dropped it on us. Yeah. And so we were actually the military was uh, uh, on alert for two weeks prior to that, where we were supposed to stand guard duty and all kinds of things, and which we did. I remember. With being on guard duty at the ammunition dump, I had my little cap, and I had a forty-five Colt on my on my hip, and that was all. 
and it was hot out there too. <laughs> so uh, we did that off and on for two weeks. And uh, on uh, December, well, 6th, 5th, uh, the, the night of December 5th, 6th, uh, we were turned loose. Everybody could go to town. It was a Saturday night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I know I went to town. We took the bus and I went to Waikiki and had dinner. And I went to the Waikiki Theater where you could always catch a good movie. It was a beautiful theater mm -hmm. first time. So I would do that oftentimes. They had all had those good old movies. So, and the movie, the theater was, had a go dome ceiling, it was blue with clouds up there, and oh, wow. stars and so forth. And, and a fellow, an organist, Edwin Sautel, played the big Wurlitzer organ. And uh, so I got to take that in whenever it was a possibility. So then, of course, back to Beth, back to Hickam, and we had just moved in. Our squadron had just moved into a set of a new two-story frame barracks, and so that's on the, the morning of December seventh. We heard all this ruckus, all the planes, and we thought, well, the Navy's having fun this morning. So we went out to watch him, <clears throat> and uh, all at once we realized that we were in trouble because uh, these big torpedo bombers were going by with the red discs on them, and, and uh, those big torpedoes, they looked tremendous, long like telephone poles, hmm. and they were flying out over us and out towards the uh, battleship row. And uh, so... Uh, we, we watched it, and then about that time, uh, this flight of B-17Es came in from California that we knew were coming, mm -hmm. and that's what kind of, con uh, kind of confused the issue that this, uh, was it Lieutenant Lockhart, was he, uh, that um, they, we, he was at the new uh, rudimentary uh, radar radar station said, "Well, it's probably just that flight coming in from the states." Mm -hmm. Well, it, no, that's not what they were seeing. Right. But that flight did came. I saw them. They came right over me, and of course they were low on fuel and no no armament. So they kind of broke up and flew to land here and there, and uh, I, I don't know how many landed at Hickam. I know one did and then it, it was hit and burst in flames and burned in two. And one of the, one of the, uh, um, I think it was a medical officer, I'm not sure, he got out and made a beeline for one of the hangars, but he was hit and killed. Mm. And uh, uh, so there were a lot of things, of course, went on that you, you see or you don't remember. Or, oh, you must have been stunned initially, yeah. I can't yeah. imagine. Now, was Hickam initially attacked, or was it? Uh, did they go after the battleship row first, or how soon after you were watching these planes did you guys come under attack? Oh, pretty much the same. They were after everybody at the same time, and uh, they hit a lot of bases. They, of course, they hit Pearl, mm -hmm. and... Uh, they hit Hickam and Wheeler and uh, Aiva Marine Base, uh, Kaneohe uh, Marine Base over on the east side of the island. They, anything they could get, Bellows Field and so on. So they were after everybody. Mm. So uh, uh, about to run down, but <laughs> anyway. Uh, I watched all this <clears throat> going on for a while, and I saw, as I mentioned, the B-17s or anything else. And uh, then I, I thought, really, I better get out of the, I better seek some cover. Sure. So 
I uh, started. I looked around, and <clears throat> there were. Uh, I was a little ways from these new barracks, and I looked, and a lot of the guys had gone into this frame barracks, and they were looking out these windows, or a lot of were underneath because they were off the ground, and you could see all these white faces. And I thought, well, this is kind of dumb, because a pilot can. Our gunners can see all those people and they're dropping these little anti-personnel bombs and uh, so I thought well I'm, that's not for me so I turned to go to a masonry com a complex of brick buildings there was a post office a PX uh, or a beer garden and, and so on mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, uh, I, I didn't get there because I, as I started, I looked, and here came, I, it was, a, I think, a Kate, a uh, Japanese dive bomber, oh, came boy. across right at me, oh, right man. at me, and I looked up at the guy, in the, the gunner in the back, he was looking at me, honest to John, looking at me, and I was looking at him, and he fired at me. He, he just missed me. But the reason I say he missed me, he was so close he couldn't hit me. If he'd been further away, he'd have gotten a better shot. So anyway, I hit the ground, and uh, the plane right then was turning away, and it burst into flames. Somebody must have hit it somewhere, and it burst into flame, flames from wingtip to wingtip, nose to tail, and just kept flying on away. So. Uh, they lost three men, three Japs there, and a, and, a, and a good airplane. So I don't know how far it got, it, but I suppose it probably made it to the harbor. I don't know. Yeah. Wow. But uh, anyway, be that as it may, I uh, I looked around and as there had been a lot of construction, and here was a hole in the ground, a pit, with a water pipe sticking up. So I dived into that, and it was a good vantage point. I, I laid in there on my back and I could see all the zeros going over and the torpedo bombers and so on going out to Battleship Row and, and the other and the rest of the harbor. And uh, so I, I just I laid there and I for watched them and uh, uh, I could see a, a, a flight of high level, level bombers going over and they, uh, they got over battleship row in the Arizona, they, uh, I saw them drop their bombs, and uh, I'm convinced that one of those is what sunk the Arizona, because those bombs did hit the Arizona, they glanced, they hit the, the gun turrets, and, and they're pretty heavy, and, they, and I know one they said one drop ricocheted off, hit the deck and went through it and down into the powder magazine. Mm. So uh, now things it blew up there. Now to give us, an, uh, myself and for people to watch us, an idea where Hickam is in relationship to Battle Row, could you see Battle Row? Is it, was it across the harbor from Battle Row? And was, from your vantage point, could you see? Actually, there are uh, the Hickam and Pearl Harbor are adjacent okay. and were uh, uh, separated by a chain link fence. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, and, okay. And so we're close. Now, Hickam Field is officially part of Pearl Harbor. It's been changed. They've taken out the fences and so on. Uh, but, uh, of course, Hickam took a pounding too. Right. Not like Pearl did. I was glad I wasn't in the Navy. <laughs> Boy. The, uh, now, how how far away in your hole were you from the from the tarmac where all the planes were lined up? And oh, I was oh probably city block. Oh boy. And uh, I had a friend who's he's passed away now. He used to live here, in uh, close by from here. His name was Oscar Hazard. His son still lives here. His wife, his wife was a, a whack of officer, and uh, Oscar was a uh, warrant officer. Anyway, his experience during that attack was uh, 
he and about I don't know how many others dived into this what was an electrical box. Fortunately somebody had shut off the electricity to them. They would have been fried yeah. too. But yeah. anyhow, but a lot of that of those things happened. People were just fortunate that they made it through. And now, what about that barracks that you look back on and thought that wasn't a good idea? Did that ever did that uh, survive? Did those guys all survive? They didn't touch it. Is that right? Okay. No, they didn't touch it. Yeah. However, I am sure the same plane that came towards me had previously come across the big concrete and steel barracks with this big mess hall. Uh, a plane dropped a bomb in that mess hall and uh, the concussion killed 31 men mm. who had taken refuge in a cooler. So, and I think it was the same plane. Wow. wow. So, so fortunate or unfortunate things happened. Yeah, right, right. So how long were you in the hole? How long, by and large, was the, the, the attack before you felt oh, safe enough to get out, come out and see? I suppose I was, uh, I suppose I may have been in there half an hour. And I got out, excuse me, and uh, this, that initial attack was over, so everybody came out, and then uh, we had to get up to where we were, we had to get up to the Air Force headquarters, so somebody came along with a, a vehicle, and we climbed into it and, and rode up there. So then the second attack started, and uh, so we were strafed again, and this old sergeant got us, who's in, in charge of us, got us to get into this little building, and, and uh, uh, pretty soon uh, an old colonel, colonel came out of the headquarters building and, and uh, told the sergeant to get us one at a time into this headquarters building, much safer, so, because the, but the strafing was going on at the time. He was, he was a nice old gentleman, full colonel, and uh, uh, old Colonel Rayleigh, hmm. but, so, anyway, uh, I was at the, uh, Headquarters near the uh, intelligence, the uh, G2 office, and I, th I think that's correct. Two, uh, and it was their intelligence office, and and uh, I remember prior to the colonel coming out, a, a, a lieutenant came out and came in and said, "I want two volunteers to move those two aviation fuel trucks." Who are they? Well, they're 3,000 gallons apiece, parked not far away, very volatile. So two friends of mine jumped up just like that, and they went out and they moved those trucks. Wow. And, and uh, so, well, they were awarded. They both got a Purple Heart. They weren't a, a war, or they weren't injured, but they didn't. At least they were quick enough to get out and, and do what was requested. But, but there's a lot of that went on, too. So. Yeah. Yeah. They they were <clears throat> remained good buddies during the war. One was Harold O'Connell, a red cat headland Irish, you know, from Brooklyn, New York. And his buddy was a easy going, laid back Harold or uh, Charles Siler from Camden, Arkansas. <laughs> they were good buddies. <laughs> so they got into uh, uh, the uh, armament business and their job was to strip and clean and repair sh machine guns oh, okay. uh, after that. Okay. So. Can you describe to us now what uh, the scene, what, what things looked like after the second attack and what the field and your surroundings were like? If you can just kind of give us a feeling of what you were seeing. Well, a lot of things were sh shot up. The uh, barrack, uh, the uh, Hangers were, of course, they weren't destroyed, they're pretty sturdy, but like this 1B-17 that had landed uh, had, was virtually burned in two. There, a, a lot of the, the planes had been lined, lined up right, on right. the 
on the field. So some of those were sh shot up uh, and uh, damaged. And we had the, the old obsolete B-18s, several of those, and some later model A-20s, and, uh, and uh, uh, they started using as soon as they could get them going to uh, start patrolling. Uh, the bar big barracks suffered a lot of damage. They killed, I don't know how many men in the, uh, it was, a, as I recall, it was three stories, and I believe it was to house 3,200 men. And uh, so it, it, was a, it was a big state-of-the-art barracks at the time. Mm. And a uh, big, big mess hall, kitchen, and each area had its big day room and so forth. It was nice. Mm. So, but you, it, it was heavily damaged. And uh, I lost two friends who were in the oh, barracks. Boy. One was a kid that I, well, no, he wasn't. Uh, his two friends, one was from San Antonio, he was, anyway, he was from Texas. Okay. And the other guy was a, a Jewish fellow from back, back east. So, uh, mm -hmm. this, this fellow I started to mention that I enlisted with well, came from Iowa. We rode the train together and we went through everything. And he was in the, the uh, base operations, like their traffic controllers now. Okay. And uh, so he, he came out of the bar of that big barracks. Uh, and I saw him as I went by uh, that morning. He, he had his his helmet and his gas mask and was headed off to work. <laughs> and uh, Richard Lester, he's, he was an Iowa farm boy. And then uh, anyway, he, uh, Well, he he passed away here a few years ago. So, hmm. can you describe what, uh, for once again, for people like myself and others that watch this that have never been in battle, never been shot at, what what's going through your mind? Do you remember what you were thinking as you, you saw this plane coming and you were shot at? There's explosions and bombs everywhere. What what goes through a person's mind during that time? I don't know what goes through it. Yeah. Look out, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, so, uh, but honest, the thing that, pre uh, that I remember is I can see this man with his, his wow, gun. Wow, and he, <laughs> he, he was so close, I could see his face, wow. and he was looking at me. And fortunately, he couldn't hit me. Oh. But that cost him three, three men, just like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, you think back, about those, they were poor kids too, told what they had to do. And uh, so, they, they, of course, they hated us because of the propaganda. And yeah, so sure, right. And uh, right. so. So we're, we're at, uh, you've made it through the second wave attack. Can, can you take your story from there then after the second wave came through? <laughs> well, I was, the second wave had ceased, and this young lieutenant pilot, wings on his shirt, and uh, came out and saw me. Says, "Let's get in this car and take me to Barber's Power Point as fast as you can." Now that's quite a statement to give to a twenty-year-old, twenty-one-year-old kid in a Ford V8. <laughs> I was a little scared anyway, <laughs> so we went, and after the, everybody that could drive had come out on the highway to to look at the damage, and fortunately I don't know how they kept 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 all the people in one. It was a three-lane highway, and they kept all these cars in one lane. So we went, we started up that highway in the middle lane at 
90 miles an hour. It was not good. Wow. <laughs> and I, I remember I was hitting or blowing the horn, and there was a, a Marine at the at the Pearl City interche intersection directing traffic, and he, he must have been six foot six. <laughs> he saw me coming, and he just took off. <laughs> a smart man. <laughs> anyway, we went right by it. There was the Arizona was healing over there oh. and on fire, and so and a lot of my others were. So it was a tragic thing because the, the, these fellow kids, these had to get off of those ships and to that oily water, which was on fire too. So that was terrible. Mm. Now, what was the purpose of this lieutenant wanting to get up to that point? I never did know except that there were two uh, two planes, a Navy and a Japanese plane down there together. And uh, apparently the Navy plane had intercepted the Japanese plane. And uh, whether they ran together or one shot the other down, I don't know. But they went down together. Everybody was dead. The, the ambulance crews had loaded them in when we got there. So. And we, we, uh, this lieutenant and I were busy. He, they had made him a courier, and uh, I don't, I can't tell you where all we went, what we did. We just a, a blur. Yeah, sure. As fast as we could go, we drove all day and I, I think all night. And every time there was a noise, the air would be full of tracer bullets. Wow. And. Uh, because everybody was so nervous, and they'd hear something, they're going to get it. So because there was a worry then that uh, J uh, Hawaii was going to be, they were going to invade Hawaii. Was well, that, that was the, the impression. Yeah. that was what was going to happen. It wasn't so, but everybody thought that was it. It would be it. So mm. they didn't come prepared to do that. Mm. Good. So over these next couple of days, it doesn't sound like you got a whole lot of sleep, and and were you were you able to stop for to get a bite to eat, or were you just running purely on adrenaline, or? Well, you just ran, I, because while I was out on one of these trips, our people, our offices and uh, headquarters and everything just disappeared from where they were. The mess sergeant, they they took everything, but they did leave a a sheet cake on the, on the counter, so I got a piece of cake. <laughs> and uh, I don't know where we went, we just went. Uh, just send us here and there, and then the, uh, it was the next, was the next day I think I found, found my outfit. They had moved into this old crater, well, kind of crater, and the years ago in the past had dug tunnels into the side of the and they were set up in these one of the in these tunnels mm -hmm. and uh, so I uh, it was the next day I got anything to eat really except uh, was it the next one day anyway the uh, was the Red Cross was there or uh, yeah with ladies in a little coffee trailer, you can get a cup of coffee. So I got coffee. <laughs> but you didn't care, you were getting kind of lean anyway. And so, <laughs> so uh, uh, well, I know driving this lieutenant around, very patient, nice guy, sitting back there in the back seat. Next day he said, do you suppose we could slow this thing down? <laughs> <laughs> so we did, but that poor guy. They pretty soon they put him in the B seventeen as a pilot, and uh, a couple of weeks later he became a flying at night. He became disoriented and flew into the side of a mountain. Oh, is that right? I huh. saw the flames. Of the plane. Uh, well, that's a shame. Yeah. But, let me ask you a question about the home front. Now, uh, I imagine your folks were, like anybody else, would sit in, uh, on a Sunday afternoon and all of a sudden they hear word about Pearl Harbor. I can't imagine what they must have been thinking about. How soon after were you able to get word to them that, 
you know, Mom, Dad, I'm okay, I made it. Uh, well, I don't remember s several days. Uh, they, Mother and Dad and my brother were out trying out a, a, a Ford, a Ford in 1944 that they were, and uh, Dad was buying, I think, to help keep my brother home on the farm. <laughs> Anyway, they, it was the first car they had with a radio in it, oh. and that's, they heard it on the radio. So, of course, uh, they were pretty fearful. But I that's remember I have a, a letter from my mother. Anyway. So... Uh, so they found out uh, days later that your, your mom just had this feeling that you were, she just knew you were okay, but she hadn't gotten word from you yet. She just knew that you were okay or? Well, that her, was her, her hope. Her hope. Oh, wow. Yeah. Dad, in his letter, said that uh, uh, Uncle Sam is mad now. <laughs> and uh, to cheer me up. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And so. He wrote a good letter, and so. Uh, well, we got everything running together here. That's all right. We'll get back. So, was there uh, uh, was there a three a three wave attack, or was it just a two, two. just a two? Okay. So everything's kind of got settled down, I guess. I mean, I imagine there was still a lot of chaos and. Oh yes. Yeah. There's there's one incident that I just tickles me about <clears throat> during the attack this uh, there were two young fresh lieutenant pilots at Wheeler Field they had during this uh, uh, period of, of uh, alert they were flying a uh, oh, gunnery practice out of a little grass strip at the north end of the island, Holly Eva Field. I'd been there many times. They flew these P-40s out of there. And uh, so uh, when, uh, when the, the attack came, they were at, uh, at Wheeler Field. They'd been partying the night before, and playing poker and one thing and another. And this young I think Lieutenant Taylor heard, heard all this going on, and he called his buddy to get up, and, and uh, they uh, he called they called the uh, crew chiefs down at Holly Eva Field to get their planes armed, gassed, and ready because they were coming, and they could jump in this kid's Buick, uh, Lieutenant Taylor, and Lieutenant. Welch. He was Welch was from the grape juice people. Oh, is that right? Yeah. And they jumped in this kid's Buick and drove down, to, I think, 10 miles, as hard as they could go. Got there, and the crew chief of the crew had the P-40s ready, as ready as they could get them. And they jumped in, and there was, as I recall, a major chewing at them for get, doing that when it wasn't authorized. <laughs> and they, this, Taylor says, well, to hell with that, and they, they took off, huh. and Taylor was fly, flying, uh, firing his guns as he took off. They, between the two of them, got three Jap planes, uh, six Jap planes that morning. Taylor was hit and had to land, and they got re-ammunition, refueled, and took off again. And <laughs> They raised cane with the Japanese. I'll be done. Yeah, uh -huh. and that always amused me how they got in there gung ho. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. And I thought that was great. And uh, Taylor went on. He he got injured and couldn't fly anymore, but uh, he was always a commanding officer up in Alaska for a while. He'd become a brigadier general. And he, not long ago, he was buried at Arlington. Mm. And the other Welsh became well, uh, a, uh, an ace himself in the South Pacific. Mm. And they, they were flying these venerable old P-40s. But 
Now those old planes, old P-40s, had quite a history. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember the first one I ever saw. We'd I'd read about them. I didn't. It was taking off at Hickam Field, and I didn't think the thing would ever get off the ground. But but Taylor and Welch, they got theirs off the ground. So, uh -huh. and during this attack, one of those old B-17s that had come in, they had to land someplace, so it landed in that little like grass field. It must have been uh, required a little piloting skill to get it in there. So they did it, and then they flew it out of there a few days later. Hmm. Uh, I don't know, I heard also that two landed in there, but they landed any place that they could. Right. They, they could right. So. And there was nothing they could do about the attack because they came over, they'd stripped all the armor, uh, yeah. guns out of it, correct? Yeah, yeah. No, they had no armament hmm. available, and the fuel was running low. So I had one friend who had been a uh, radio operator on the one that landed up at, at Holly Eva. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, so. Wow. Well, getting back to your story then, so after you met up with your unit, did you discontinue driving that lieutenant around and, and rejoin your unit, or where, where did it take your story from there? Well, I, no, I, they put me in charge of a, of a post to send a transportation vehicles or whoever, where, to send them wherever they were needed. Okay. So I, uh, mosquitoes were thick, they didn't, they uh, didn't apparently carry any problems, but they sure did keep you itching. <laughs> and uh, so that's what I did for a while. And then I got back and, and uh, they didn't have anything else to do. They put us in, a, uh, made us into an uh, inspection team. We went uh, around the island and inspected different transportation units, see that they were maintaining and so forth. So I did that for quite a while. Then I, I was charged, then later uh, had their, was their sergeant in charge of their uh, transportation for the headquarters and so on. So I did that for a while until they were through with me there. <laughs> How long did it take before there was a like a sense of calm or things kind of got half, back to halfway normalcy? Oh, I don't know. Some month, three weeks, I really don't remember. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. recall. So. And then did they uh, start rebuilding uh, all the, the, the structures again and, yes, and they rebuild started, the, started the re repairing and, and so on. Okay. Yeah, they got busy as soon as they could. And, yeah. yeah. And then now, uh, so it's somewhat back to normal. Uh, you're. Did you spend your whole military time there during the war at Hickam, or how long were you there at Hickam? I, I was there until July of 1943. Then they, I'd been there for how long? Three and a half years or so, and so they sent me back to, uh, to uh, Cal well, they sent me back to Ohio, right, right, Patterson, and uh, there were a lot of returnees there and uh, so we were there for we got to catch up on our furlough time and so were you forth. able on your way to Ohio able to veer off and go home for for a visit or well yes I got to have a de delay en route and I think I got to my Minneapolis and uh, I think I called my folks from there on a Sunday morning that and I thought I had sent them a telegram, but the fellow that took the messages and so forth, where it was supposed to go, kept the money, and the folks didn't ever get the word. Oh, is that right? So it became quite a shock to them. Here I was about to land on their doorstep, and they didn't know I was around. Now, had that been the first time you'd been home since you uh, since you went off? Then? Yes. So that three and a half years or so since you'd been home? Yes. 
Wow. That must have been somewhat of a homecoming. I it was, yeah. It was a homecoming. I was there for, oh, I suppose I had 10 days or two weeks. Then I was sent on to Ohio. And I had another furlough. And go back again and back because I had furlough time to burn. Oh, sure, yeah. And, uh, so I'd go home. Maybe I'd help my dad a little bit and, and visit around. And so go visit other relatives, other part of the state, and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. And then from Ohio, where did you go? Uh, where were you shipped well, up? Well, the amount of men that the Army had doing nothing, because they had come back and that were, they had no, they just killed time. Mm -hmm. So we did, and then they sent us on a troop train from Dayton to, supposed to go to, where was it, San Luis Obispo. And it was a, it was a, a, a nice Pullman train, compartments and everything. And uh, they fed us every two days, or every two, twice a day. And uh, good, good food. And, uh, but they changed us again. They now, at this us. time, sorry to interrupt, were you moving as a unit or were you more or less solo? We're pretty much solo. Okay. They're just scattered. You lost okay. Track. okay. We lost track. I lost track of all my friends uh -huh. and uh, made new ones. And some of them I wish I could relocate and I can't. And uh, uh, then they, they changed us again and sent us to Fresno, California. And we spent months there in the old uh, was it fairgrounds and uh, doing nothing again. And once in a while we'd have a little job to do. I know I took a crew and went to McClellan Air Force Base, Sacramento, and were to pick up a P-39. And we had to take the engine out of it and get the plane added on it load it on a trailer and take it to Fresno. So things like that we did. But it's just kind of loose ends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I got to, I wanted to do something. So I looked to see if there was any schools coming up. And so the aircraft propeller school came. They needed people, so I applied and went to that, <clears throat> and that was a good thing. <clears throat> and uh, they sent me from uh, then to Caldwell, New, Jer New Jersey, to the uh, Curtis Electric Propeller Factory. So went through that, and then <clears throat> sent me to Pawkatuck, Rhode Island, to the Hamilton Standard plant. Went through that, <clears throat> learned to maintenance, repair, and, and everything about them, supposedly everything anyway. Then sent to Dayton, Ohio to, uh, <clears throat> again, to, uh, and then up to uh, Visalia, Ohio, to the General Motors School. And uh, that's when the uh, old constellations were, if you remember them, airliners, mm -hmm. they were using them as uh, Test planes to try their. They were trying to develop new pro, new propellers and the, what they were primarily trying to prepare to develop was a plane a, a propeller that could fire through the hub of the of the of the uh, propeller. Oh, okay. Which they had in the P thirty nine because the engine of the plane, the, Kirk, uh, the Allison engine, was behind the pilot, and, and it drove with a uh, drive shaft to the front to this propeller with the hole through the hub, and and they had, they could fire thirty seven millimeter cannons through. Huh. So anyway, they tried did a lot of things. The Russians, by the way, liked that P-39. They use it as a tank buster with that little cannon in the nose. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's that's beside the point, I yeah, guess. Yeah.
So boy, they got you crisscrossing all over the country at this point. Then you, uh, well, you got a I, solid good chunk of the country. I don't know how many times I went from one end of the country to the other on a train. Wow. <laughs> so I, I really did. I so, back to the East Coast and school, back to the West Coast, back, back, and back. So. Uh. Must have been a fascinating time, though. I mean, to see well, the, the big yeah. cities and the East Coast, and, yes. and 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 you'd mentioned all your various friends uh, from Arkansas and New Jersey. It must have been very interesting too to meet different people from different parts of the country. And yeah, there's uh, some, you know, it's too bad because uh, you lost track of them. This one good friend, he and I were in mischief together for a while, and he he contacted me years later here. No, was it? Where was I? Anyway, wherever it was. And, uh, yeah, I was living here in Fort Collins. And he was in the insurance business, and somehow we didn't come, uh, he talked to me. Some friend of mine in Davenport, Iowa, knew where I was, and, and they, so he got in touch with me. And I don't know why we didn't stay connected. Mm. Okay, but I can't find him. So, mm. so uh, yeah. anyway. So uh, you continued with your schooling, and, and is, this, is this what you were doing when the war came to an end, or uh, continued your story, I guess, from oh, the various schooling? Oh, well, yeah, I, I uh, went through the aircraft training, and they sent me then to Wright Patterson Air Force Base to uh, the uh, Air Technical Service Command and put me in the propeller section. So I was to write orders on how to fix these propellers that didn't work. And so wow. so that, that was a good thing. And, uh, yeah, that, was, that was good. So I was there until the end of the war. <clears throat> so. Oh, and, uh, well, anyway, I met my future wife there, too. In, in Dayton? Yeah. She was in another section. Yeah, talk about, talk about, tell that story. <laughs> well, if I can cut it off and tell the story. <laughs> anyway, I was a fairly random I, I could do most of what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. and uh, one fella <clears throat> uh, mentioned to me that there was a nice-looking blonde girl up in, near his section, and he wanted to know where, how close I was to uh, where I came from to to Montezuma, Iowa. Oh, it was 25 miles. And he said, "Well, there's this nice-looking." Blonde girl up there, and uh, why don't you come up and see her? So he'd go sit on her desk and visit with her. She ran, she had graduated from the AIB in Des Moines and did business machines. And so, well, don't miss an opportunity. So I went up and, and I saw her, and uh, we started visiting and we started dating, and, and uh, from there on, uh, she became my wife in 1946. I'll be there. And, uh, and you and you grew up. Well, you're only 25 miles apart in Iowa, at your hometown. Yeah, at the time, yeah. yeah. At the point, initially, we uh -huh. were. So, fact is, I started a high school with her brother. Is that right? And then I moved to another school. So, anyway, she was a doll. Uh -huh. So you were discharged then in, in 46? or September 1, 46. 46. Camp Atterbury, Indiana. So. And then uh, had you guys married by, at that point, or were you engaged, or how did... Uh... We were married June 26, okay. 1946. So anyway... So you guys got married, you got out of the service. Where did you go, go from there then? Well, I... Uh, 
uh, I thought I was going to go to, to uh, college and study engineering and uh, anyway, uh, in one of my trips home to my parents then lived in northern Iowa. Uh, it was winter and I was didn't feel good. And my mother wanted me to go see this chiropractor she'd heard so much about, and I thought, well, okay, to make her happy, I'll go. So I uh, was walking down the street, and there was a sign up above, and I went up and uh, met this nice older lady. She had been a nurse in World War I, and so she she uh, uh, talked to me, visited, and, and uh, she treated me, and uh, I left. And in the meantime, she asked what I was going to do, and she said, well, she was out recruiting. <laughs> you should go to Davenport and become a chiropractor. And I thought, well, that's the silliest thing I ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I, I felt better when I left her. I didn't hurt anymore. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, uh, I, I liked the, this lady. I enjoyed listing with her. So when I was back again, I went in to see her. And she planted another seed. I still thought it was... And then I got to thinking about it. You know, really, that's a pretty nice way to make a living. So, <clears throat> eventually, I ended up down at Palmer College in Davenport. I went through there and met some other friends. And now, were you able to use, uh, take advantage of the GI Bill for your yes, schooling? Yes, okay. GI Bill. Okay. There, there were a bunch of guys there on the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Ah, uh, most of them are gone now, but I'm still here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's the way friends go. Sure. Anyway, uh, I ended up eventually here in Fort Collins. Now, what brought you here to, to Fort Collins? Oh, one of my high school teachers uh, in the summer would take his boys on a trip. And one of the trips was through Colorado. And here, I, I gone down up Mount Evans and Colorado Springs and so on. And I liked it. And uh, when I was in the uh, service, I would take a delirium route to Denver. Or, and, uh, thought Denver was a pretty nice little town, but it grew. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, then, oh, back in 1950, I was, I'd set up my practice in Grinnell, Iowa, and I was there, but I uh, still, I had a good practice going, but I had a, a itchy foot, and uh, some another guy I knew came in to pay me one day, and he said he was. It was a hot, dry summer there, and the farmers were just uh, discouraged and so on. And he said he was going to go to Durango, Colorado, and work for the Vanadium Corporation. I thought, boy, that sure sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> so I went home and I told Irma, "Let's move to Colorado." She said, you're out of your mind. <laughs> anyway, we started investigating, and two years later, I had my license here and moved out here. So I've been here ever since. How many years did you, did you practice? Thirty-five. Thirty-five years? And it was, a good, it was a good profession for you? Did you enjoy it? It was a good choice? Uh, yes. Yeah. I like it. I enjoyed it. You got a lot of good people, and uh, I, I retired, what, in 82 or 83, and so ever since I've been retired, so. Oh, very good. <laughs> so, a uh, nice young man has my practice, and, and 
he's doing fine. And so here talk, I am. Talk, talk a little bit about your family. Uh, you said you had two children, a son and a yeah, daughter? I have yeah, two good kids. My son, Daryl, is now 64 years old. He uh, taught school in Denver, Cherokee High for, he started teaching school out at New Raymer on the prairie. Mm -hmm, yeah. He's out, he loved it out there, but his, his wife uh, was not a prairie girl. Yeah. And uh, anyway, he ended up at Cherry Creek High in Denver, and he liked that, and they liked him. And he's, so he's retired from there, but they keep bringing him back to substitute as a science teacher. So, uh -huh. And he likes that because the kids, a lot of his kids, they'll call him up and he takes them to lunch, and or they go fishing and so forth. He's kept track of a lot of his kids. So. So that's, and he's married to a, his, one of his school friends, Dora Dottie, and uh, she was an elementary school teacher. They both graduated from UNC in Greeley, and uh, she's, uh, so she's retired too. And they have three grandkids, three little boys, and they're about to have another one, so. So uh, all together, let's, let's, can you add it all up? How many grandchildren do you have and how many great-grandchildren? I have two grandchildren. Uh, I have a daughter, before I better not forget my daughter. Oh, sure, yeah. She, uh, she's retired, our uh, uh, registered nurse. And she and her husband are retired. They live up at Cherry Cut, uh, Crystal Lakes near, okay. near Red Feather. So, uh, uh, and they have no children, but uh, but they live up there, and they, they like being in the mountains. Sure. And uh, uh, I have two two grandkids, Chris, who is a uh, oh, God. He's uh, yeah. the. Uh, Anyway, uh, he graduated from CU as a chemical engineer, but he didn't want to be a chemical engineer. So, anyway, he uh, eventually he got uh, he had a job as a, a computer. What? Anyway, then he went to Duke, got his B as a MBA there, Duke. And he's doing very well. Mm. He's married to a young lady who's a VP of some insurance company in in uh, uh, Denver uh, Tech Center. Okay. So and he's switched science since switched from the construction company or building company he was with to uh, the disc company, which apparently is a much better situation for him. And my granddaughter, who's about to become a mama again, she's a sweet girl too. She's, she's a registered nurse, uh, uh, and she graduated from CU and then went to nursing school out in Philadelphia and graduated cum laude there. Pretty girl, bright girl. And uh, she came back and she had a job as, with the Indian Health Services in Denver for, for a while until then she, she quit that. But in, in the meantime, she thought they needed a, a midwife, so back to med school she went <laughs> uh -huh. and got to be a midwife. And she's delivering babies for the Lutheran Hospital in Westminster. Good girl. So she and her husband have one little boy, I call him Charlie, <laughs> which is a good name for a little boy. And uh, they're going to have another little boy here pretty soon, in October. I said, well, you can have that one for my birthday. There you go. You're not, you'll be 90 this year, correct? I will in October, wow. yes. I'll wow. be 90. Wow. 90 is a pretty good age that the males in my family reach. My dad did. 
So I will be there. Wonderful. I have no plans beyond that, but who knows? <laughs> uh -huh. So anyway, it's been a Tough year for you, huh? You, you lost uh, your wife in, in January, you said? Yeah. And you were married, you said 64 years? 64. 64. Mm. Anyway. <laughs> these things happen. They say there's nothing you can do about it. They just happen. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Well, Keith, we'll start to wind down this interview. Is there anything that I didn't ask you or any stories that have popped up since we've been talking here that you wanted to get on this tape so we kind of hopefully rounded out and caught as much of your story as possible? Or do you think we did a, a good job of catching your story? Oh, I think you did. You know, uh, Wright Field, well, I was at Wright Patterson, Wright Field was an extremely interesting place if you liked airplanes. And they, they developed all kinds of stuff there. And I would uh, have time off. I'd go down to the, to the uh, labs, the engine lab or the propeller labs or something, poke around and go down in the basement. I remember one time I was down there poking around and over a co in the corner on a stand was an old Liberty engine aircraft engine from where way back when sitting up there and uh, you find all kinds of things like that. I went to the propeller lab one day and my god there was a, a propeller there that was designed for the B-36 which was a huge old airplane with how many engines, uh, atom bomber, big thing. The blades, my God, were that wide, and and how many feet die? Huge stuff, and an engine for that plane was huge. How many cylinders? Nine to thirty-six cylinders. <laughs> Here it was, standing on the side. It could pique your interest there. Yeah. yeah. You know? So anyway, that's some of the things I did there. Now, have you ever had a chance uh, to ever go back to, to Pearl? Have you been back? I was back, back once. Irma and I went with friends of mine in Greeley. We had a convention in, in Honolulu. Now, you're part of the Pearl Harbor Survivor Association? Yeah. Okay. And that's what you went back for, for that? No. No? Oh. It was a chiropractic convention. Oh, oh okay. There. And uh, so we went together there. And fiddled around the island, traveled around, and I went to Hickam Field and, and showed them where, where I'd been and went to Wheeler and so forth and wow. all around the island and so forth. And, uh, uh, but somebody asked me the other, I have a friend in, in Kiwanis who, who knew somebody else with my same name. Uh, he came up and he said, well, are you going to go back to Hawaii? I said, no, I've been there. So anyway, he goes, but he has a son living there, They're almost near that Holly Eva base. Field. Mm. You know, when we got into the war, then the United States began building air bases, especially on, on uh, Oahu. They, they, they had Hickam and Wheeler and, and the Navy had bases and so on. And then they started building bases to accommodate not only the B-17s and the B-24s, but then they started building bases for the B-29s. Oh. And I remember clear out on the northwest corner of, the, of Oahu, they were building a, a big, long, you know, runways for the 29s and so on, and so it was, it was a busy place. I'll bet, yeah. yeah. And then when the Battle of Midway came, June 19, uh, June 1942, uh, uh, that was a Navy battle, 
primarily, mm -hmm. but the Air Corps was out there too with B-17s and, and uh, whatever. And some of those little B-17s came back pretty well shot up too, you know, from... Uh, and uh, But still it was mainly a Navy battle. The Navy won the battle for us and, yeah. and lost a lot of men yeah. doing it. So those guys had a lot of guts. Yeah, wow. Wow. Can't imagine. Hmm. And I remember when Jimmy Doolittle and his carrier of B 25s t took off. I remember that. And it must have been a real morale booster, wasn't it? It was. Oh, yeah. you can't imagine. Yeah. Yes, it was. Go get them. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah. That was, a, that was a great morale booster. Wonderful. Well, one question I always like to ask at the end of the interview. How do you think your war experience played a part in your life, changed your life, changed your, your thoughts at all, or was it just simply a chapter you went through? How would, how would you answer that, do you think? Well, yeah, it was a chapter I went to and, and uh, shifted me in a different direction than I might have been, or quite a different direction than I might have been had it not have been for the war. I, when I got through with the, ready to be discharged, I, I had employment uh, opportunities. I could have gone with, as a propeller man to work for the Pan American Airways. Mm. And uh, of course they were out of, uh, out of business, but I could have worked for, I could have stayed in the service in my grade and doing what I was doing, or I could have gone into civil service and done the same thing. Irma could have stayed in civil service, but we didn't. So, yeah, I to tell you the truth, I was so irritated with the Air Corps then, being a kid and so forth. I I just got fed up with them uh, because. As I put it, at the end of the war, one of the things, Irma and I were married, we were living in Dayton, but every whip stitch, it seemed like the Air Corps had more promotions than they knew what to do with. And uh, so every few days we'd get a new commanding general and uh, he'd have to instill discipline in the troops. So everybody then, you had to be back at the base at whatever time in the morning for calisthenics and breakfast and all this. And, uh, and uh, I just uh, was through with it. I yeah, didn't sure. want any more of it. Sure. And uh, so I, yeah, I was through with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Well, is there any sort of uh, closing statement you would like to make to to those that will watch this uh, this tape to kind of cap off this interview, or or is or not? I uh, mostly are not. Okay. All right. <laughs> anyway, uh, well, well, Keith, I want to I want to thank you for sitting down to tell your story today, but more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. You can tell them I love them all. Good kids. I'm proud of them.